Thank you for joining us. The art education faculty in the School of Visual Art and Design are excited to have Dr. Sharif Bey join us today for a lecture and hands-on workshop. I would like to start with a brief introduction of Dr. Bey. Uh, Dr. Bay was originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He lives and works in Syracuse, New York, where in addition to his studio practice, he is an associate professor in art education and teaching and leadership in the College of Visual and Performing Arts at Syracuse University's School of Education. He earned his BFA in ceramics from Slippery Rock University of Pennsylvania and MFA in studio art from the University of North Carolina and a PhD in art education from Penn State University. He has participated in many artists in residencies and fellowships to hone his craft and is included in numerous public collections, including the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Renwick Gallery in DC, and the Columbus Museum of Art in Ohio, just to name a few. He has a very extensive bio. So I will stop right here, but uh, before I introduce Dr. Okay. I'm sorry, before I turn it over to Dr. Bay, I would like to let you know that the, at the end of his talk, uh, that we will have about 15 minutes of Q&A. So it, at any point, if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in the uh, chat box and we will respond to those. Dr. Bay will respond to those questions at the end of his talk. Thank you so much. Dr. Bay. Thank you. It's, it's lovely to zoom in to uh, Columbia, South Carolina. I was going to say it's lovely to be here, but I know we're not here. I'm also used to responding to applause after that. So there's no applause. So my cue is off. So um, I want to share a couple of things with you, but before I get started, I want you to understand that um, I hold a dual appointment at Syracuse University. I'm in the School of Education, and I'm also in the, uh, the Studio Arts program, the College of Arts, um, of Studio Arts, and, and to include illustration. So I, I have a dual role as, a, as not only a researcher and a scholar, but also as a studio artist and a teaching artist. So I'm going to share some things about my life, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm just going to get started here and share my screen, hopefully, with no problem. 30 seconds. Did somebody confirm that I'm working? It's, yeah. Okay, thank you. So the title of my presentation is Making Art Out Loud, Ceramics and Life, Life and Ceramics. And one of the reasons that, uh, that I use that term, making art out loud, is because you know, for better or for worse, a lot of scholars in art education aren't either afforded, supported, or in some instances allowed the opportunity to continue to cultivate their identities as uh, as studio artists, as practitioners, as makers. And um, and for, for my entire professional life and formative life, I've always had making as as the foremost part of my identity. So I'm going to kind of go jump right in here and talk to you a little bit about some of my formative experiences. And I'm going to cover a lot of ground here very quickly. So I'm going to show a lot of slides in the next few minutes. So uh, I want to start by saying that um, I kind of was raised in what I now describe as an anti-imperialist family. So there was a, always a criticality in my house. My grandparents migrated from Tennessee about a little bit more than 100 years ago to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they got involved in a movement that kind of predated the Garvey movement from the Moorish movement and, and led by uh, a man named Timothy Drew Ali. At, at any rate, one of the things about that, it was, there, was a, there was a consciousness about you know, what the United States was doing specifically globally in the world and, and what the dynamic of race and the subjugation, subjugation of people of color, you know, was how that was afflicted upon people and how we can kind of cultivate a positive self-image as a result of that. So when I say that, essentially what I'm saying is that um, we weren't allowed any white dolls in my house. We weren't allowed to play with white action figures. There were a lot of programs that were consciously uh, omitted from my house. And, and, and I, you know, as a kid, I didn't understand why. I wanted to watch Tarzan and Superman and you know, some of these shows. But the way that I say it in short, I know I'm dating myself because you don't know a lot of these actors, but 
you know, Cleopatra was not, you know, Liz Taylor. Uh, my Superman was not Christopher Reeves. And, and having that kind of ongoing criticality in my life with regards to aesthetics and representation kind of, you know, contributed a lot to who I am and who I became. So my, um, I also want to add real quickly that my, my, my grandparents on my mom and dad's side had more than 11 kids. And coming, you know, on the heels of the Great Depression, most of them were born in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And being, you know, kind of being grown up through the Depression and also seeking alternative ways of cultivating the spirit. All of my uncles and aunts played instruments and they all had some sort of practice, whether they were sewers or carvers or doodlers, they had, they had a practice. And I wanna share with you, these, these are images of, of, of canes that my father carved when he was just a young teenager. And unfortunately, you know, he was pressed to kind of start working at a very young age and art did not uh, result in income so he was able, unfortunately, was able to had to stop. One of the things he told me when I asked him, because as somebody who's researched the Harlem Renaissance, I always say, well, well, Dad, where did these influences come? Why are you looking at these interesting non-Western influences? And he told me that, you know, if it, you know, in all of his time, free time, he he would fish, and he said, but in the winter time, if it was raining, he was at the museum, and a lot of these influences came through by way of his exposure to pre-Columbian and non-Western art. So I want to say that, you know, we didn't exactly have a, a very specific alternative to these white representations, but as a result of that, we'd have to kind of find this unique creative space where we were perpetually kind of working it out. So we knew what we weren't, but we were perpetually reaching out to find out what we were and latching on to other representations and influences that weren't of, you know, a European or white descent. Um, this, these are, my uncle uh, retired earlier than the rest of his brothers because he was much older and he lived across the street and these are they're actually renovating now but he had a humongous influence on me as a child because he was perpetually working you know building painting sculpting and this is just a mural in his living room but also um, there's actually a, a pond a koi pond in his living room you could see uh, this kind of under renovation with a, a fountain that he carved out of wood and it's tube running through it um, my aunt actually uh, was an, a, a pretty extensive traveler in the 1950s and 60s, which was unprecedented for a woman of her age to travel the world. But unfortunately, her husband uh, died in a tragic accident and she took her sons and moved to Cairo in like 1960. And, you know, the influences between Cairo and Pittsburgh had this odd, you know, mashup of creative energy resulting from the visual culture of the 70s, and the visual culture of my aunt sending things back or making trips back and forth to, to Cairo. So um, within all this, I started a wonderful community arts program when I was a high school kid called the Manchester Craftsman's Guild. And once I found out I had this um, free access and kind of carte blanche at this art center, you couldn't push me out the door. And I spent the next four years working and building my portfolio at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild and literally going all over because they were always, once I found a sense of comfort and confidence within that community that also included a continuing ed program, uh, I got to know lots of the art teachers in the city schools because they were always working there to get renewal credits, um, hobbyists, retirees, old ladies. Ironically, you know, I started at the after school program, but my making community became this interesting intergenerational, uh, inter interracial, interclass kind of experience. And we had the common denominator of, of our interest in working in ceramics. So I have this slide here because I just wanna share all these programs that I took advantage of as, as a high school student between age 14 and age 17. Pre-college art programs, summer workshops, uh, collaborations. And again, the, 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 the networks that came out of this and the visiting artist workshops you know, people coming in on Saturday and making works over the weekend and having slide lectures and exhibitions. It just showed me so many, uh, not just cultural and aesthetic, but so many professional trajectories within the arts to where the, the demystification of what an artist can be was a process that started for me at a very young age. So when people would say things like, oh, what are you going to do to starve an artist? I can name, you know, dozens of people who had careers, who were thriving, some who were working in academia and some who weren't. So these are just things that I made when I was a high school kid. 
So heaven going off into the world, this is David McDonald, who's still a good friend of mine, who I spend time with every week. I met David, who's a, who was then a professor, ironically, at Syracuse University when I was 14 years old. And for the last 30 something years, he and I have been corresponding and getting to know each other. But again, having uh, kind of uh, essentially kind of satellite homes within academia from a high school age and specifically identifying with uh, contemporary ceramic artists who were of color, they were few and far between. But I, I got to know faculty from Howard University and Hampton University and, um, and David McDonald was then at Slipper, excuse me, at Syracuse University. So there was an additional network. This is David and I firing together in the 80s at Touchstone Center for Crafts in Pennsylvania. So he's weak, you know, one of the things about ceramics that's really important and special is this kind of visceral exchange. And for those of you who are gonna be joining my workshop this afternoon, you'll see how much information that you can impart on somebody in such a short time. So to spend a weekend and, and, and attend a lecture with, with, with some of these artists was, was transformative for me as someone who kind of quote unquote got it as a young age. So firing and camping over the weekend with artists and working within an artist community, and also kind of in some regards, uh, help me cultivate you know an old spirit because I'm again I'm hanging out with like the guy on the left of me in this picture is a retired ceramic engineer. The guy on the right of me is a college professor, and this is me spending my spare time over the summer when I was 15. Um, and I think that you know going away all these all these programs you know positioned me very well to kind of open myself up to the world. So uh, when I went to Slippery Rock University, which is a small state school, the main reason I, I wanted to go to this small school was because first of all, I had built relationships with some of the faculty there from when I was in high school and they recruited me. But also I heard about these wonderful innovative programs that they established at world renowned institutions and then the former Soviet bloc that kind of crumbled shortly thereafter. So I spent a couple of years of my college career via Slippery Rock University, Northwest Pennsylvania, in the former Czechoslovakia at the Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Bratislava, Slovakia. So going over there immediately had a dramatic change on my work, specifically moving away from potter's wheel and more decorative objects, kind of working and feeling and, and, and using the clay almost to kind of sketch. I think it became really important to me to think about the material in a way where it's more temporal and, and more about ideation than, than, than making an object. So again, something else that threads through a lot of my work and philosophy is this notion of art as verb versus art as noun. And interestingly, these are the kind of works that I was making and that traveling the world, looking at museums, and I can't even begin to get into what I was thinking out about at the time, but it was definitely more about formal elements of space and surface and lighting and you know, it really became kind of a, uh, a call to action when some things were starting to happen in, in Pittsburgh in the city where I'm from. Because I started to think that like, when something like this happens in front of my mother's house and, and we get you know, eight or 10 cop cars to apprehend an eighth grade boy who allegedly has information and you know, gang violence and all the other things that plague many of our cities that were kind of reaching a, a zenith in the, in the 90s, it really started to make me assess what my role is as an artist and, and, and what does it mean where, okay, I'm safe. I'm in University of North Carolina casting bronze. Meanwhile, I got nephews and cousins and younger brothers getting shot at and incarcerated. And, you know, so I really started to kind of investigate this space is, you know, what is my responsibility as an artist of color to my community? Statistically, I already made it. I've been through college and I, at this point I was pursuing a master's degree. So immediately my, my ideas about my work started to change. And this led to my dissertation research that began to look back at the black arts movement in the 1970s and the new Negro movement at about a hundred years ago when these questions were kind of at, um, at the forefront and, and arguably as the, 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 the current interest in, in artists of color and the commodification of our cultural production becomes a, a part of a new conversation, that question is at the forefront once again. So these things are, are cyclical, right? So we're at a point now where that question, but what is the relationship between what I do as an artist and the community that I care most about is my own people within the context of this larger community of American citizens. So the work naturally started to change. 
message. I started to think about images. I started to think about the reception of my audience. And also started thinking about these issues uh, as I started to work them out myself, because thinking through a material and processing through a material and healing through a material is what artists essentially should, could, might do. So again, there's verb and then there's noun. So this was kind of the blockbuster of my MFA program at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. And it's a piece essentially, I wanna say, I wanna make this very clear that this is not necessarily, this is what this work is intended to convey. What I wanna to communicate to you is, this is what I was processing as I produced this work. So we're talking about a year's worth of work here where I made 2000 of these objects and started to break them. And, and you know, there's a lot that occurs in, in, in the process of, uh, of, 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 of a year or so. So what I started to think about is the vessel, which is kind of my orientation as an artist. Each of these is made as a vessel. There's a specific racial physiognomy where these things read as having African features. But then there's this idea of fragmentation. And then there's this idea of these things being kind of haphazardly displaced and mounted. The, this, the, this piece was actually displayed in the Smithsonian last a year and a half ago. And the way that this piece is actually installed is it shows up in a half dozen 55 gallon buckets. And the idea is that you dump it out on a hard surface. And there's an extension of meaning that comes out of this idea of displacement and fragmentation. And, you know, there's like obviously like the slave ship, that, you know, uh, congestion, but then there's like this idea of fragmented histories, but then there's also this idea of lost information. So for me to stack, you know, a motif, you know, 200, 300 times in one area, there's there's information and connection that's implied, but it's not really overt, it's not obvious. So this became, I mean, I was just, uh, I, I would say relatively speaking, it's, I was just a kid when I made this piece, I was 25 years old, but I, I really started to get into a different headspace about what my work means for me. And that's something I, I say a lot to young people where I appropriate JFK and I said, you know, ask not what you can do for art, but what art can do for you. I think there's so many young artists who are kind of trying to crack the code and, and figure out how they can make it or how they can make a living. But we don't realize that most fundamentally art could, should be for the human spirit and yours included, or yours especially if you're an art teacher, because you're not going to be able to inspire and invigorate people if you don't understand the value of the transformative power of art by way of your own lived experience. So interestingly, coming out of grad school and getting a teaching job put me in a different headspace again. So my community, my identity as, a, as an African-American man, but now here's my identity as a teacher, working with young people who have the diversity of needs. So immediately I started to think, well, I need to impress these kids. I need to show them that I can relate to them in a way that they want to see me make things that are beautiful and make things that take skill. I don't know if I've showed up, you know, when I was 25 working with high school kids and started breaking pots and, and, and shattering things and burying them, that they would actually we would have a commonality. So that we call this uh, expert power in art education or in education in general. So finding ways to kind of pull them in by way of, you know, fundamental skills and woe them with aesthetic uh, achievements. So these are, you know, vessels that I've made on the wheel or carved. So um, out of that experience, I taught for a, sh a short time and I was kind of recruited serendipitously by Charles Gerarian. And it was just like a happenstance at Penn State where my, ironically, my brother was going there to be a, um, he, he needed to go interview for a geography PhD uh, position and his car broke down and it happened to be my day off and I drove him to Penn State and I actually knew the faculty there from my early days as a young ceramic artist at the Craftsman's Guild and I had lunch with one of the faculty and he introduced me to some folks in art education. Nothing to lose, nothing to gain, just like I'm running my mouth now. I start running my mouth to the faculty and I'm like, you need to come to school here. We'll help you find money. We'll help support you. And I went from, you know, having uh, two kids at home and to, to trying to work it out and figure out how I was going to make it as a doctoral student. Now, the ironic thing about that is I had a, a newborn and a toddler, and I was still trying to maintain a studio practice. And in this, in this space, in this photograph here, what you see is me uh, working and beginning to work in small increments. And, and one thing that has, you know, this really kind of part of my story 
or my brand, so to speak, is realizing that, you know, art can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And sometimes it takes an attitude adjustment to find a way to sustain a creative practice within the landscape of our busy, busy days and our complex identities as parents, as teachers, as professionals. Like how do we, you know, the same thing, if I'm trying to keep in shape, I have to figure out a workout regimen that is conducive to my lifestyle. It might mean I work out less, it might mean I get up earlier, it might mean I stay up late. But in this case, it meant me working incrementally in small bits. So as opposed to me working on a series of teapots, clay is a very time sensitive material where I have to run up and down the steps and try to juggle things and relieve my wife who's taking care of kids. It, it became an important thing for me to be able to work in a, in a scale that is expendable, but also something I can finish maybe in five or 10 minutes. But five or 10 minutes times 100 became a body of work. So I'd make these beat type forms and I would later uh, uh, integrate my kids into the process. And my daughter grew up making things. My son grew up making things with me. Mostly my daughter, really. My son's help a little bit. But my daughter is a very skilled, uh, I would say she's a very skilled you know, person with regards to her hands and her ability to respond to things. And, and eventually these little things started to make their ways into larger compositions. This is some of the inspiration that fueled this work. Starting to think more conceptually about adornment, but also pushing the scale of adornment to the point where it becomes sculpture. And thinking about you know, the history of adornment. These are the Mardi Gras Indians. This is a, a, Berber, a Berber princess in um, North Africa, Mardi Gras Indians, North New Orleans. And just started to think about ideas of identity and adornment and, and, and thinking about the interesting kind of polarization of identity, individual identity versus collective identity. So this is me and my individual self. And, and sometimes that's the, the, the idea of, of individual versus collective can be at odds for a lot of different reasons, but also thinking of how we are branded as people. So here's a series of work to kind of expand it from that period. And this is the work for which I kind of became known over the years. And, and it was a very modest means really, um, and also very minimal facility. So a lot of this work was literally made in my living room and fired in the backyard or in the fireplace. Um, the other thing I want to add that's important specifically about being an artist or, or specifically about being a potter is the aesthetic education that goes along with it. Uh, we have a term we use in Europe more so than the United States. We talk about applied art. So the idea of, of where an object or an image you know, fits into the landscape of our life. And I didn't have this growing up with uh, 12 brothers and sisters and rambunctious cousins wrestling in the living room. Um, the idea of having our own space, your own room, the idea of even one single dish or mug surviving it, uh, for four or five years was un 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 unlikely. So this idea of me coming from an, an educational background, it's about you know, ritual and the preciousness of objects and appropriating objects to fit in your lifestyle. You know, this is um, my kids literally curating the meal, where we're going to eat, what we're going to eat, you know, what objects we're going to eat and drink from. And, and they have a literal an archive of things that they can think about how they work and how they may or may not work into a given setting or meal. And also to me, you know, I love making pots because as opposed to the more conceptual things that I make that are about grabbing one's attention and communicating or conveying a certain idea. I love the modesty of making functional pots. And again, for my own sense of humility, I continually revisit that. I often say it's like, it's like a frame. You know, you don't want to upstage your, your corn salsa or your cucumber salad. You want to kind of reconcile the goals of reconciliation of what that experience is. So here are just some more quiet functional vessels that I make throughout the years. And these kinds of things I've been making you know, since high school and I continue to revisit. This particular pot is from a series I call Pots I Would Have Made in the 90s. And I wanna say about functional pots is everything about them by comparison is so different. The markets, the way we engage people. I mean, for years, I just put a tent in my front yard and go out there with a cup of coffee and try to clear out some of my inventory. I mean, I now have a gallery in Chelsea. It's a very different way of engaging people. It's a very different market, very different price points, very different conversation. But I think it's as equally, if not more important, especially because it reaches 
people in a different way. A lot of times people drive up on my lawn expecting a, it's, that it's a yard sale and end up buying pots. We have these great conversations about, you know, why buy a functional pot for me if you can buy a cereal bowl from Martha Stewart or Pier One or, or Dollar General. So again, in keeping with this idea of working from home and trying to sustain a creative identity without interrupting or, or, or in any way taking away from the expectations or demands of parenthood or being a good husband, I found these interesting and crafty ways of, of keeping it in the house. So this is kind of unprecedented. I'm pulling handles in the living room. And these are just a series of at home and fired in, a, in another kiln. Um, less, uh, the first sabbatical I went on at Syracuse University, I was fortunate to receive uh, an artist residency at the John Michael Kohler Art Center, which works in conjunction with Kohler Plumbing. So just to where the, the urinals and the sinks are made in an industry, they have a program there called Arts, Arts and Industry, and it's about 70 years old, where artists go there and they work within the context of the industrial facility to produce bodies of work. So my work changed dramatically because it shifted from me making these intimate, small beaded forms at home into these more mass produced, uh, higher fired beads. And they're quite exacting because they're made, um, they're made in mass from these molded mold forms and, and using the same slip as they would for casting a sink or uh, a toilet. It's a very dense and, and guarded secret is this material in, at Wisconsin and Kohler. So this is me working in a residency day and night, and it, it had a dramatic impact on, on my work and the kinds of, uh, well, these are wall pieces, but they're made in proximity to the body. And initially they were designed for, you know, for female bodies specifically, but I, I think that they only, not only they trans, trans, transcend gender now, but I, I think of my works now as being even beyond the body. Like I, I sometimes entertain the idea that I'm making necklaces for gods, so they become They've gone from being overwhelming to a human body to six, seven, eight feet wide and tall. Um, I continue to do artist workshops throughout the country. And one of the things, sometimes throughout the world, really, because I've also done some in, um, in Asia and Africa. But I love the visceral aspect of ceramics, but also the performative aspects of ceramics and what it does for my own work. So a lot of times, because I don't want to just go to do a workshop, like in this case, and do something that I already know how to do and just demonstrate, oh, here's me in my comfort zone making this thing that I've been making since 1990. I always set, a lot, set aside time for play and discovery. And I wanna share something from these two little pieces I made at this, uh, this small school in Kentucky and how they have eventually been integrated into new bodies of work. So just kind of note the piece on the right and left. That's just some squatty form I played with with these nails. It eventually became this piece, it's like 30 inches tall. And I made a whole series of these. This is what came out of the, uh, the piece on the right. And this piece is now in the collection of the Smithsonian. This is me firing another piece at home. It's also part of a museum collection. I also wanna note, you know, you know, this is me firing. It used to be a koi pond in my backyard and I converted it into a pit for my yard. And those are my two sons. This is years ago, they're big now, playing basketball in the driveway. This is me firing at night. My wife took this picture, but she said it, she said she looked out the window and said it looked like I was coming out of the fire. Um, another piece made in my living room. Of course, there's a, a cultural precedent for impaling ceramics, or excuse me, impaling ceremonial objects um, in Kisi is West African. And I, that's just too, it's too heavy to get into the depths of that right now. But I do want to say that one of the things that, that, that's really kind of intrinsic to my work, I make stuff in a kitchen, I make stuff in a driveway, I make stuff in a backyard, I make stuff in a garage, I make stuff in the living room. So it gives me the opportunity to pull in a lot of influences from around me. It could be things that are you know, readily apparent, like some of the collection I have. I have West African objects in my house and on my walls, but there are also materials that find their way into my work by a way of you know, the garage or the kitchen. I have pieces that are finished with paste wax and turmeric. I have pieces that are finished with nails and, and auto body putty. 
So I really love the fact that they've gone from a more conventional, traditional material repertoire to a more sculptural mixed media repertoire over the years. A lot of these shards started out from me reclaiming studio uh, student work. And then because I've been doing this since I was a kid, there are lots of sites kind of like for personal excavation of my own work. I rediscover pieces all the time from, you know, like an old, an old piece from my uncle's garden or something I found in my grand, you know, or my, my, my mom's attic that I made. And, and this piece is kind of large, maybe about 26 inches, but the centerpiece is from 1994. And the rest of it kind of evolved around that. So I reclaimed this piece, I found it. I was like, you know what? I can refire this and do some stuff with it. And I just you know that's kind of the more visceral aspect of my work, problem solving, bringing things back into it. So these, uh, these shards are from, um, there's also have a stock of them available from a ceramic factory from Syracuse that has since gone under. And it's kind of like a boneyard of old broken shards that's on the east side of town. You also notice, I mean, one of the things that I, I kind of refer to myself as a sculptor who looks to the history of pottery for inspiration. A lot of times there are potters who look to sculpture, you know, but I really think of myself in reverse. I was, I, as I said, I was a potter first. So I take these conventions from all over history and I integrate them into my sculptural work. And of course I make formal concerns and I, I, I certainly I'm open to the fusion of other cultural influences, but this is like actually a stirrup form, very common in South America. Um, kind of the handle serves, and then there's a spout, almost like a handhold canteen of sorts. And this is inspired by like a jazz trumpeteer. This one is very large, maybe 30 inches, called Captain's Wheel. And here's some more new, like some newer pieces, things that I've been working on since quarantine. I got a lot of work done. Uh, this is a, an older piece. It's, it's kind of funny. I had a show a couple years ago and I, I, we relocated from that place where you saw the koi pond and we bought a new house and we moved. And I just had crates and crates and crates of, uh, of beads that were behind my garage outside. And I started, push came to shove and I started thinking of new ways of integrating them. Cause sometimes I'll make things and I don't know where they belong. I'll put it in a box or I'll put it on the shelf and there's this kind of magnetic energy that sometimes composes. So this piece did, was not contrived in any way. It was a very, you know, kind of natural progression, but I started finding beads. Oh, this, I can use more of the blue ones. And I ended up using all these beads, some of which were made like probably 2005 and they didn't find their way into work until 2017. This piece is owned by the Smithsonian as well. Um, I'm, I'm presently at the Pittsburgh Glass Center and I've been working in glass since the last, maybe since 2017. And I attribute my interest in this particular residency to some of those formative experiences I had. I said I was going away since I was in high school and I became not only accustomed to going and working in different facilities and with different communities, but kind of seeking out, you know, it's not me coming here to be who I am. It's me coming here to find out who I'll be after I meet this, this, this new community of people and start to you know make work predicated on new ideas and you know getting back to the lost wax process but now i'm casting glass so these are actually beads i kind of pointed at them these are actually beads but they're they're made in glass and solid glass is a lot um is a lot heavier a lot denser and a lot harder than ceramic i think a lot of time we think about glass we think about something that is very fragile but cast glass is is, is nothing but it's anything but that so I want to show that there are very different paces. Uh, glass is a lot more expensive. Trial and error is a lot more costly. So on the right, the left side, I want to share that that's like a half loaded kiln of beads. Most of them are made by hand, but some of them were, were cast in slip, kind of like one would cast a, slip, a, a porcelain doll. But on the right is a load of, it's a full load of glass bead. And I think it's like 10 of them. And that is even pushing it. So again, the pace, and then after I get those beads out, I have to divest them from the kiln. But then after that, I have to uh, I have to do a lot of cold working. I have to cut them on bandsaw. I have to sandblast them. So the rhythm and the amount of time to make a, a necklace form is what I call them out of clay versus out of glass. It's like um, opposite. So here are some of the earlier clay forms. These are again made at home. 
This thing is, you know, 26, 24 inches. This one is slip cast. It's much larger. This one may be like four feet long. And this is uh, just glass work, um, us being silly at the Smithsonian opening. This is uh, Ashley McFarland, who's one of uh, the technicians at the Glass Center. So another thing about glass that I want to say is, unlike a lot of different processes, like, I mean, I'm working with people at the Glass Center to realize ideas. I'm not a glass blower, I'm not a master glass caster, but I'm making forms and they're helping me cast them and they're helping me determine what colors and, and how to carry ideas forward. So those are two glass pieces. Get an idea to scale here. This is a clay and glass piece. This one is uh, unique in that it's made of glass blown forms. So I, I collaborated with a glass blower and determined which shapes that I want. And you know, we, we, we configured this composition and then I, I got support from him to, to really realize this idea. I really wasn't used to contracting out labor. Like I'm used to making all of my own stuff, not saying, hey, but I've also became accustomed to, to realizing in, in the process of things, you know, how to value my time. So I have assistants who work for me now. So if I have, you know, a hundred beads and I want them to be red, I know it's probably more practical for me to do something else to, to pay somebody to, to paint things red all day or, or to cast beads. I will make the original forms and I'll supervise it. Is there another clay and glass form? This piece is interesting um, because the glass has a very unique quality in that it responds to different kinds and qualities of light. So they call it a shift tint. So it's baby blue in natural light and, and violet under UV light. And, um, and lastly, there's so many things that I, that I don't have professional photos of that I would like to share. Um, so this is these are just screenshots from my Instagram account. And this is basically stuff that I've been doing since quarantine. I have a couple major exhibitions that are going to be rolled out in the next couple of years. And for better or for worse, they've been uh, postponed. I say for better because uh, it's given me some time to kind of respond to my own energy. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, the interest in my work has really skyrocketed, where there's been like, you know, 10 years ago, there was no interest really to speak of. And, um, and now lots of my work sells and goes into major collections. Um, and I say it's for better or for worse because sometimes it's nice to be able to, uh, to cultivate energy and respond to having things around you. It's almost like I build a team by having objects around me, but if they go out as fast as they come in, I don't get the benefit of spending time and, and kind of having a dialogue with my own work. Um, and that's really, to me, really important, specifically for an object maker because I think it's important to see how these things take up space. And I thank you. I don't think we'd have any more for you today. So I'm, I'm looking forward to some uh, insightful questions. I know I covered a lot of ground. Thank you, Sharif. So we do have one statement and question. Thanks for sharing so much of your art making so much about your art making that has happened at home and in domestic spaces, like in your bathroom and garage and your backyard. So many of our students are working at home now. What's your advice for them? What kinds of discoveries are possible when art making happens at home? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, art making should be happening at home anyway. And I think the difference is like, we make it at home for school or at home for the studio. So I think that, you know, one of the things that's important about it, it's really about an attitude adjustment. And I think that we have to get ourselves out of that headspace where we're framing our endeavors and our achievements based on some external force. Like I'll give you a short example. Uh, for a semester, my wife and I homeschooled my son. And I was going crazy because I kept thinking about what we were offering him through this lens that didn't really exist. Like he didn't have 23 people in there interrupting us, but yet I'm like comparing, you know, what we were offering him to this pace. And one of the metaphors I always use, it's like, it's like trying to make Thanksgiving dinner at McDonald's, right? This space is set up for a certain kind 
of experience and it's it's arguably efficient but it's based on a certain outcome and i would say the same thing about about school art like we have these 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 perimeters and these circumstances that set up this is the amount of time this is the class size this is how we manage these are the products but we get to the point where we become so complacent that we don't really know how to find and cultivate a critical reflective space for our own. So uh, I'm saying this to say, because the other thing that's really challenging for a lot of people, statistically, so many people won't be making art after college, to go to art school. And, and I think one of the reasons is we kind of wire ourselves to depend on that community. And that community becomes so difficult to sustain outside of an institution. And I will tell you this, it's a lot easier with things like Instagram. So it's a lot easier than it was 20 years ago. But the discourse, the motivation, the support, the, uh, the energy exchange, you know, these will be things you have to work. These, will be th these are things that most students are taking for granted. Even being scheduled. You know, I had an 8.30 studio class, 8.30 to 11. And, you know, would I get up at 7.45 to go there if somebody didn't, you know, you got to be there. It's just your responsibility. That's what you're supposed to do, you know, or, or, or on the opposite end. If I'm, if I'm working as a night owl until 3, 4 in the morning and I got a class at 9, I got to go back to my dorm or back to my room. You know, there is, there is something that kind of compels you because someone else is holding you accountable. How are you going to help? How are you going to hold yourself accountable for the cultivation of your spirit? How are you going to take responsibility for what it means to be a creative citizen who gives by way of your practice? Because your, your responsibility, as I see it, whether you're a teacher or an artist, is to stay awake. Right? And when I say that, I mean, like, don't stop looking. Don't stop asking. Don't stop smelling. Right? There are roses blooming there. And there's so many reasons for you to kind of tap out. Right. So again, right now we are essentially disciplining you, reminding you that's, that's the root of that word to stipulate to be a student. Right. Question is, you're going to continue to be a student of the world. It's just a question of how tuned in you're going to be and, and how you adjust your attitude such that you continue to learn and contribute as a student of the world. So the answer, short answer, or the long answer to that short question is that that's something that's really gonna be perpetually important to you. And it's gonna be based on an attitude adjust adjustment. I oftentimes use you know, training as an, as an example because it's the same thing. So often we have our ideas like, oh, I'm gonna get a new gym membership for New Year's and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna be better and I'm gonna take care of myself, I'm gonna eat right. And it's like the fad diet. And if you don't make a lifestyle change to where it becomes who you are and not who you're trying to be, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to work. So again, it's a pinch is more than nothing. If you keep saying, man, I'm not, I'm going to start fresh tomorrow, Monday, Monday. I'm going to, I'm going to do better on Monday, new week, new year. We're going to be, we're going to, we're going to get this done. But, but if you're just saying, you know what, I'm going to do a little something. I'm going to do a little something more tomorrow, and I'm going to keep giving. And, and hopefully you get to the point where you have that thirst and, that, and it's, it becomes a necessity. So, so my answer is, you, this is, this is actually the silver lining. If I see it, you know, maybe, maybe you'll realize that you don't need a university. You don't need Dick Blick. You don't need Crayola. You don't need Rembrandt colors. You don't need Amico. You don't need, you know, so we, we actually can make art without all of those things that people have been making art long before institutions designed to profit from it. Okay, thank you, Cherie. So I have another question. We're first starting with a comment. Uh, someone commented on the beauty uh, within your glasswork uh, what kind of glass do you use? Is it blown glass? Do you use hard or soft glass? Um, the, the primary glass that we use here for casting is called uh, bullseye glass. And, and, I, I'm, and I'm as, again, 
if, if one of the texts was here, she'd probably be bumping me under the table telling me that um, I'm, I'm not correct. But, but what I do know for sure is that different glasses have different kinds of viscosity and they necessitate, uh, you know, one might necessitate a different kind of process. I don't, um, there's one piece that I shared today that was uh, made from glass blown forms, but the majority of my work is made in the casting shop. And the main reason for that is, again, there's a kind of rigidity of form in the, in the way that my works work. And, um, and I'm working right now on some blown glass form, forms, but we're integrating tons and tons of like broken glass into them. And the main reason is that uh, it's the, the blown glass is so reflective and it just responds, it, it absorbs and reflects so much light that I lose a lot of those subtleties that interest me. So I like, uh, you know, that's one of the things I like about glass. You probably noticed that there are forms where the light shines through the glass and it's like the shadow behind the glass form has like a colorful halo around it. And that's to me really exciting. Um, but different, different glass, like we have another glass that, that, that flows differently because it's more viscous. And for some jobs, we have to change to what they call gaffer. It's a different kind of glass. But the blown glass we get comes from South Carolina, excuse me, North Carolina, Spruce Pine. It's nor near uh, Penland, uh, North Carolina, which is a popular uh, craft center. But the, the short answer is like the subtleties of, of cast glass are very different than blown glass because it, it, it's not as shiny. And I'm not as into shiny. I don't like shiny glazes either. A lot of my works, I'll use something alternative to a glaze because it's so, so shiny. Thank you. Can you say more about Menkisi, especially in terms of the relationship between jewelry and standing sculpture? A lot of Menkisi are supposed to be protective objects for a community. Do you ever install your Menkisi inspired pieces as public sculpture? Um, I have never done so. And in fact, that's, that's interesting because I talked about residencies and going away. The next big, big project that I have is actually going out to uh, Helen Mon Helena, Montana, where there is a, um, a very well-known and humongous ceramics facility called the Archie Bray Foundation. And one of the things that I'm going out to, to do is really push scale. I have an exhibition that opens in 2022, and I'm going out to Montana spring or summer 2021. And, um, and I'm budgeting for things like, what does a train car cost to fill? because the idea is to make things. And instead of using nails, I'm gonna see how successful I am at using things like railroad spikes, making things that are larger than life. But the, the short answer to that is that most of my Kisi inspired objects are you know, within maybe 12 to 30 inches. So, um, so as public art, they don't have that kind of presence. Um, but I, I do think about this idea of power, but I, I also want to say it's not exactly an appropriation, but I'm inspired by surface. You look at some of the earlier works, you see patterns and, and things of that nature on my more conservatively made pots. But, you know, impaling objects with clay shards or, or nails is another kind of pattern. And, and again, I mentioned verb, there's something very therapeutic about, you know, making that kind of pattern and, and putting countless objects in an arrangement, but I, I can't claim that these things hold the same kind of uh, ritualistic significance as the uh, as the things that 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 were that they're inspired by, because that would be um, disingenuous. Um, I'm responding to things that are important to me. I'll also say too, though, that I have this belief that you know when we spend time with an object, we we give it something. So there are things that are made, you know, more immediate. But if I have something that I, you know, done any number of things to thousands of times, you know, I just think there's, there's some sort of reverberation that comes, you know, that becomes very, very evident. And, and to me, I think a lot of that is from like what you, what you give to it and not just giving like through process, but even through time, because I, I spent a lot of time staring at these things and they keep me company. And then, they, and then they go out into the world. So I think there's something to be said for, for what we impart on an object. So where did you study glass? 
Well, that's the thing. So I'm, I'm right now I'm at the Pittsburgh glass center and I did not study glass. There's a, there's a program specifically for glass artists, excuse me, for artists who have no experience in glass. And the pro the program is called idea furnace. And sometimes it takes different forms, but you come here and you collaborate. Sometimes people come here for a couple of weeks. Sometimes people come here for a couple of months. Um, I was fortunate to be awarded uh, this glass furnace, glass, excuse me, idea furnace residency. But I was also fortunate in that I was so uh, lucky that the executive director put me on a roster and she saw I was coming and we started working things out and talking and she wrote two grants to expand my time here. I, I never got a sabbatical. I was, I was traveling. It's, I'm six hours away from the glass center. And um, we had, I had a residency that lasted for 18 months and I had a pretty nice budget, about $60,000, $70,000 to do this project here, which resulted in this, uh, this one person exhibition that several museums saw and bought work from. And, um, and again, I didn't see that coming. And the other thing, the glass theater center is kind of a, it gets really busy here in the summertime when there are classes. And then of course, it's closed down over Christmas when I'm free as a professor. So the times when I was most available is when the glass center was closed down. So, but what I would do is I would come here and I'd work with a technician. It would be these crazy long trips where I would come here like on a Thursday and stay till Sunday and work three 12 hour days and then go back and teach on Monday. And, um, and I've been doing that in various capacities, but I had my exhibition in 2018 and I was recently invited back to do another iteration of the, the idea furnace. So I have some glass experience, but I still work closely with people to, to realize these projects. And I wanna make sure that's important because people should understand that it's not magic, that it's work and it's science and it's skill. And I don't have all that information and skill. I have ideas and we work between us and I'm gaining more what they have and they're gaining more what I have. And along the way we build a relationship and we, um, we cultivate ideas. I'm now on the board of directors here. And that's not something that happened overnight, but over the last three years, getting to know people here and working out ideas. And now I'm a big advocate at this center because I, I see what it can do. Pittsburgh Glass Center is like a, um, I, I, I describe it as a, uh, a museum dedicated to process. Because there's, you know, right now, of course, it's different because of, the, you know, the pandemic. But it's one of those places where you can walk in off the street and sit in the bleachers and watch people cast and blow glass for hours because it's open like that for people. And then you could sign up and do a small workshop for nothing. And then of course you can do a little, a bigger workshop that is, you know, that requires a nominal fee. But it, it's really about educating people about history, process, aesthetics, possibilities in glass. So I'm now a big ambassador as you can tell, but um, I've just, I just got really lucky in that coincidentally that material became can, can really conducive to my work. And people were really receptive to how aspects of my existing work translated into glass or was informed by the, by the materiality and process of glass. It's funny because now people think I'm a glass artist and I guess kind of I am, but, but it's, really, it's really not something I wear, you know, because it's, uh, it's complicated, right? So we are coming to the end of the questions. We have one last uh, question. Have you ever had a time in your life when you felt like art making didn't matter so much? Have you ever lost faith in your work as an artist? Um, I, I've been making art my ento entire adult life. And when I was a kid, when I say like kid, I was like 14, 15, I had these visions of grandeur that, that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. So it's really kind of like a dream come true. But yeah, so 30 years ago, I was planning to be the person I am right now. And there were times where I stopped thinking about that, which is kind of a good thing. Like I, I stopped dreaming so big and start thinking about where I'm at instead of where I'm dreaming about going. So it's almost like, uh, I tell doctoral students that all the time, I said, Stop staring at the top of the mountain and take a couple steps, you know, because if you're thinking about this insurmountable road 
and you're, you're charting your path based on other people's expectations, it's different. Now, I will say that the other thing that's interesting about this is that um, if, if I'm talking about from 14 to 46, you know, one of the things that happened between that time is I kind of grew up, right? But I was still kind of committed to making. So what started to get in the way is life. Not necessarily discouraged, but like there's a time when I was doing knucklehead stuff that knucklehead kids do. A time when I was, girls were more important than art. You know, there's a time in my life when that happened. And, um, you know, but, but even when I was a knucklehead college student, I always tried to contain things to where I could do things in the studio. We have friends hanging out and stuff. It's like, why don't you come down? I'm make, making pottery. Like, who wants to come down and watch me make pottery? But, uh, but I was successful in finding a level of selfishness where I could still be productive. But as far as not believing in my work, I don't know that I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm just really blessed in that I realize also that I have a lot of passion and that's not typical for everybody. Everybody's not blessed to find their passion when they're 14, 15 years old. And, um, and I know that I'm unusual in that I had that. And I, don't, I won't say that there was self-doubt, but just like if you would have told me 20 years ago that I was gonna get a PhD in art education, I wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told me 10 years ago that I'd have work in major museums all over the country and in some other continents, I wouldn't have believed that either. I wouldn't have. So, but if you'd have told me when I was 15 that I was, I'd have been like, yeah, I'm on it. But there was a time in my life where my ultimate goals changed. And, um, and you start dreaming a different dream. And it doesn't mean you're becoming complacent. It doesn't mean you don't believe in yourself. You just start thinking differently. So at one point it was about studies in art education and, and presenting at the national conference. And that was, what, that was what I wanted to do. And that's in grant writing. And that's what I wanted to do. And that's not really in my direct sight right now. I'm thinking about other things. But uh, so I think what I'm trying to say is, you know, ambitions change, values change. And, and I'm fortunate in that mine, they kind of run together. Like, like my wife is a nurse and lactation consultant. And if, if you looked at the things that she was doing 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen any relationships. I'm sure her parents were like, what the hell is she gonna end up doing with her life? But all this different kind of work, human development and family studies, anthropology, nursing, it all kind of funneled together to create this unique professional identity where she is perfect for the job that she does. The same reason, like my writing, like I didn't need to go and get a, a PhD to do the kind of work that I'm doing right now. I, didn't, I mean, MFA is a terminal degree for a studio artist. So if I was gonna be a studio artist, but I'll tell you one thing, I don't regret the PhD that I got for a second because first it positions me optimally to write about my work and to, to talk about the linked assessment outcomes and the, uh, the curricular outcomes and, and the work that museum educators, docents love, love talking to me because I can speak docent. So, you know, again, it, it, it's, it's a little bit different in terms of like, you know, the, the other thing I want to say, I know we're, we're, we're wrapping up is there is like this whole, there's a show business aspect to being in the art world. And I realized that you know, I haven't been in the art world but two or three years. I'm in the art world now, and it's a very different. It's a very different mechanism. It's not like selling pottery out in your yard. It's not like selling ceramics out of at a gallery. It's it, it's you know, there's a very different things, and I think that the important thing for me now that I'm getting successful or, or I'm successful is kind of keeping my head and reminding myself that you know, things rise and fall so quickly that. Uh, while getting all this attention and notoriety right now, you know, next year, everybody can stop loving me. And that could be a very, very big fall if you're not prepared for the inevitability that that will happen. So I think that that's something else that's a whole part of the fame game associated with, you know, what I'm talking about. It's, it's kind of at odds with what I'm talking about, transformation and the human spirit, you know, because there are people selling artworks for, Lots and lots of money, and there's lots and lots of ego that goes with that. But thank you much, so much, Sharif. Uh, one of the things that resonated with me is that thinking about the fact that 
making art is its own workout regimen. And I think that's just very important for our students, for anyone who has an interest in the arts, who is in, in an arts profession. Uh, we look forward to hearing and seeing more of your work. Very fascinated with your future work that will happen out in Montana. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, we thank you so much for joining the, us this afternoon. And if those of you who are with us right now, if you are interested in the hands-on workshop, it will start at 2.30 2 p.m. Thank 28 you. minutes. 28 minutes from now. And for those of you who, who won't make it, you know, stay tuned and you you're, feel free to follow me on Instagram. Thank you.